again, this the intent of this is to provide basically a, ro a Rosetta Stone to bring together the various theories of psychology into one comprehensive integrated model. Emotions, music, conscious, gestalt, biology, perceptual control theory, philosophy, creativity, humanism, virtual reality, behaviorism, psychodynamic, physics, cognitive science, and FLMP is a fuzzy logical model of perception. So all of these will be brought together and integrated into one model. And the, the glyph, the image that popped up and disappeared, that was an image of the uh, Rosetta, Rosetta Stone behind the integrated model which I call emotive energy. But let's start with physics. Now, the most important part of this is the formula E equals MC squared by, by Albert Einstein. It says that everything is a form of energy. There are no exceptions. So you name it, you know, birds and animals and fish and, and forests and mountains and oceans and the entire earth and the entire universe, as well as our thinking and our emotions. So they all are forms of energy. So that's the foundation of emotive energy. It's a form of energy. Now, as a result, every living organism is an energy system, and this was stated by Elizabeth Duffy. She died in 1954, but uh, the reference I have is from 1962, so it's not clear to me when she made this statement, but it was almost undoubtedly in the first half of the 20th century, and she said every organism is an energy system. And she goes on to say that our emotions are energy too, and there's no clear differentiation between emotion and non-emotion. So this idea of a difference between rational thinking and emotion is not clear. And it also is that activation of emotion is on a continuum from a very low degree to a very high degree. And that explains our, or many people thinking that rational thought is not emotional. And that's because the emotion involved is a very, very low uh, level of emotion and it's almost imperceptible. And that actually will be presented here shortly as we get into humanism. Okay, back to our overall screen of the various models that are being integrated. The next one will be humanism. And basically it's Maslow's pecking order. It's, he called it a hierarchy of needs and it comes from his paper in Psychological Review back in 1943. And it was called in the article, A, a Theory of Human Motivation. Uh, and his full name was Abraham H. Maslow. I've forgotten what the H is for. But it's usually presented as a pyramid, which he never stated in his 1943 paper. I have no idea where this came from, but lots of people present it as a pyramid. And it's about what Maslow calls five sets of goals. He says we could call it needs as well. And on the bottom there is physiological needs, safety needs, love needs, esteem need, and self-actualization. And self-actualization 
he borrowed from another guy, Kurt Goldstein, I think his name was. And basically what that means is what are you best at? What is your star power? Are you a master or an artist or an explorer, or a champion? What are you really good at? So that's self-actualization. And going back down the list, esteem, better term as far as I'm concerned, is confidence. Yeah, self-esteem, uh, we've heard that, but what does it really mean? But self-confidence mean, means something to almost everybody. When we understand confidence, esteem, eh, not so much. <laughs> so I believe confidence is a better description of that level than going down one. He calls it love, but in reality, it relates to people, fundamentally. People we love, family, friends, kids, parents, so forth. So if it's about people, it's actually a social uh, situation. So I prefer the idea of social for that level. It's a social need. One down... Uh, I use a, a dollar sign for the S, and rather than safety, and even Maslow claimed some fuzziness with that, but we need resources to live, uh, things like clothes and a home, an automobile and so forth, and since these we acquire mostly through money, that's why I use the dollar sign for the S. So we need resources, and often that is founded within money. But on the bottom, which is actually the most important level, is ph physiological needs which sustain life. And the three identified there, air, water, and food, are listed in the order of priority. You can survive maybe for a week or two without food. You won't like it, but <laughs> you can probably survive that long. But for water, you need it more often. Maybe only a few days can you go without water. But most of all, you need air within seconds, if not a few minutes, to survive. So not only are those three the most important uh, resources or factors of life, things that we absolutely need, but even the pecking order within that layer is different. Air is more important than water and water is more important than food, even though those three things are more important than all of the items listed in the levels above and that's misleading that's why i do not like the pyramid model so we're going to be changing that the first modification is we're going to chop that pyramid in half and we're going to turn it into a wedge and those levels are still there physiological safety love esteem self-actualization and i've also given some quick symbols for those different levels. The uh, rightmost self-actualization, I've given a little star, that's your star power, but more important than self-actualization is confidence. And you want your confidence to go up. That's why there's an up arrow underneath it. And the love needs, I've represented it with a heart. And then the next level, resources, I've given it a couple dollar signs. And then the most important level is on the left, physiological needs, that's air, water, and food, and that sustains life. So I've stipulated life. Now, the way Maslow describes this hierarchy, he says they arrange themselves in hier hierarchies of prepotency. And that's a, a useless term. You have to run to a dictionary to try and figure out what he's actually trying to say. What is prepotency? And that means it's a pecking order. So the pecking order 
goes from left to right. Top priority is to the left. Physiological needs are the top priority. Then the next one down is safety or resource needs. And then the one in the middle, those are social needs, love, so forth. Then the next one is confidence. And uh, finally, self-actualization is actually on the bottom. It's the least important of all of the priorities, which the pyramid model is very misleading. Whoever created that did not understand the 1943 paper. So this is the first modification. Is first you chop that stupid pyramid in half and you create a wedge out of it. But all the things he talked about, physiology, safety, love, esteem, self-actualization, those are valid. It's just should not have been pre presented in a pyramid. All right. So the next thing we're going to do is kind of beef up that wedge. And again, he said there are five sets of goals and needs. And uh, he also said man is a perpetually wanting animal. So he introduces the ideas of idea of wants. And it was clear when you read his paper that he uses other terms. He uses desires and appetites. So goals, needs, wants. He was struggling to find the best term. And to me, even though he says hierarchy of needs, needs is not the best term. And that is clearly shown with the idea uh, on your birthday, would you like cake and ice cream? Would you really need cake and ice cream or do you just want it? So that's the problem with the idea of needs. There are things that we want, but we don't need. But if you need it, you're going to want it. <laughs> so, so want is a much more inclusive, comprehensive term than needs. So the second modification here is that I'm going to change this to a hierarchy of wants, and that's the second modification. So we chopped the pyramid in half, and now we call it the hierarchy of wants, and that's basically a pecking order. And there it is, that's the pecking order of life. Third modification is how do priorities work? Uh, how are decisions made? Well, first of all, back to the beginning of this, everything is a form of energy. So priorities and decisions must be based upon energy competition. <clears throat> Therefore, wants are ideas with energy and power. And the most powerful energy goes to the physiological needs. And then they go down lesser and lesser energy as you go down the pecking order. So it's within the pecking order that decisions and priorities and are established. Now, this corresponds with neuroscientist Christoph Koch. An idea corresponds to a coalition of neurons, and it is clear that a winner-take-all competition plays a key role. So that is how neuroscience is describing what, what Maslow came up with. There is a pecking order, and the pecking order is based on energy, which is what the neurons present. If you have a coalition of neurons, then they all work as a group, and the empowerment of the neurons, the level of energy they can produce is going to be significantly higher than the competitors if it's a physiological need, air, water, and food. So this agrees with neuroscience. All right, so we have the wedge, which is what we want. And at the bottom again, I've got my symbols, life, money, love, confidence, star power. And here we have a bucket of swill. Would you like a bucket of swill with germs and toxins and so forth? Probably not. So this is the next modification. Not only are there things that we want, but there are things we don't want. So there are actually two wedges. And these wedges are opposite and equal. So what does that mean? 
Well, on the left, the most important factor is life itself. We want life. So the opposite is death, the far right red column. And they are opposite, but they are equal in power. Our desire for life is equal to our desire to avoid death. So, the, so those circuits in our brain are of equal power, but they are opposite concepts. And eventually in, a, in another presentation, this will be the tornado diagram, but I don't want to present that offhand or in the first video. So those two columns are opposite, but of equal value. And then going inward, the dollar column, the orange one, that is similar to the lack of resources. We want resources to the left, and we want to avoid the lack of resources, not having any money or so forth. In the middle one, the yellow column, that's our social needs and so forth. And on the right, we don't want to have our heart broken. We don't want to be lonely or without friends and family and so forth. And then continuing toward the center, the green mark of confidence. We want our confidence to go up and not down. So again, our desire for confidence is equal to our desire to avoid a lack of confidence. And finally, the star power. We don't want our star to fade. We don't want to have no uh, special uh, abilities. We don't want to look at ourselves as a statistic. We want to be more than a statistic. All right. So there are things we want, things we don't want. And in the middle, that's neutral. Those are things we just don't care about, like how many threads of material are in a carpet in your house. How many hairs do you have on your head? How many uh, pieces of gravel are in your yard? The clouds up high in the sky called cirrus, how high are they? 20,000 feet, 23,000 feet, 23,422 and five inches. I mean, what, <clears throat> who cares? And there are a lot of things that we just don't care about. So those are of neutral value. We don't want them, but it's not that we don't want them. We just don't care. So there are the three levels and it actually ends up being a value scale. This is Maslow's pecking order. He doesn't call it that, but rather than calling it a hierarchy of anything, most people understand the idea of a pecking order and we'll call it a value scale. And on the value scale, uh, the green end are things that we want, the red end things that we don't want, and the stuff in the middle, we just don't care. So let's call the things we want as positive value on the value scale. Things we don't want are negative on the value scale and neutral down on the bottom it might be hard to read it says don't care ignore so things that are positive we like we want we seek them things we that have a negative value we dislike we fear them and we avoid them so the important thing with maslow's hierarchy of what i prefer hierarchy of wants is that it establishes a pecking order. Okay, coming back to the main screen before we go on to the, the next item on that list. Any questions about the pecking order or humanism? No. Okay, was that pretty no. clear? Yeah, that was easy to follow. Okay, good. All right, let's go on to the next one, and that is behaviorism. Now, behaviorism, the version I'm using is from the 1974 
actually it was published in 76. Uh, it was published by B.F. Skinner. He was a famous uh, behavior psychologist. Behaviorism is the general group of theories. And it's sometimes referred to as operant conditioning and also reinforcement. You'll hear those terms. So he had basically a box and he only used three parts of the box. He broke it into quadrants, but he only used three quadrants. The first one he called positive reinforcement. And then he had another one that he called negative reinforcement. And we'll eventually call that fight or flight, which relates to neuroscience. And then the last one, he, well, first of all, negative reinforcement generates behavior. And the third uh, box he has, he called punishment. And there are two flavors of punishment, positive and negative punishment. And the intent of punishment is designed to remove a behavior. And again, I'm referring that book about behaviorism and it was on page 68. So you can look this stuff up. All right. So what about that last box there? Is there a fourth or is that my mistake or is that <laughs> Skinner's? blunder and it appears that others have noticed that and even Skinner brings the issue up the expressions I like Brahms I love Brahms can be regarded as the music of Brahms is reinforcement was well, it negative reinforcement <laughs> fight or flight do you go running screaming from the building when you hear Brahms <laughs> probably not Punishment? Well, if you don't like Brahms, maybe it is punishment. But in general, the most famous piece of music from Brahms is Brahms Lullaby. And you play it for little babies to help them go asleep. And sleep is what that last block is all about. It's about rest and, de and digest. So it is positive but it is different from typical reward. And, and let's explain his various blocks here. And I like to use a little horse sense. So with, uh, and you can substitute Math, uh, Pavlov's dog or Thor Thorndike's cat if you want, just some critter, but I, I prefer a horse. And so for positive reinforcement, you offer a carrot to the horse and it's gonna come over to you and maybe at a gallop, it likes carrots. So that's what positive reinforcement is. You offer something to the critter that it likes and it will cause the, the critter to be active and, and do something for you. Of course, negative reinforcement the critter does something, but it's because you're threatening it. And if you use a whip, then uh, the horse doesn't like that. But if it understands that it needs to get moving when you strike it with the whip or riding crop, whatever you got, then that explains negative reinforcement. Now for punishment, that usually happens when you want to stop that horse and you say, whoa, and you pull on the reins. Now the reins are attached to a, a metal bit that goes in the horse's mouth. And it's very uncomfortable when you pull back on the reins, it forces that piece of metal deep into the mouth of the horse and that hurts. So very quickly the horse <laughs> understands, hey, you want the horse to stop. So that's what it does. It uh, it's punishment and it, punishment is designed to reduce or eliminate behavior. And if you've got a horse that's moving, running, you want it to decrease or stop, you pull on the bit. So that takes care of the three blocks that
that Skinner was talking about, the fourth block, well, that gets back to sleeping all critters, just about, especially mammals, need sleep. And if they don't sleep, they'll die. With humans, there's a fatal disease called FFI, fatal familial insomnia. It generally is genetic with a, in a family, but there are cases where it is uh, comes on without a genetic pre uh, you know genetic basis. It's almost like it's a on the fly modification. But it's it's fatal. People who start suffering from insomnia, FFI, they'll die after about three or four months, maybe less. And it also shows up in uh, research by Rechthofen, Bergman, and Everson and Toth. And they did sleep deprivation studies in, with rats. And they found out that if you don't allow a, a rat to sleep, then after two weeks, it'll die. And it was uniform. There were no exceptions. They all died. So we need our sleep. And sleep apparently is the ideal state of the body. Everything is working beautifully and perfectly, including your immune system. And it turned out the reason these rats died is because whatever pathogen or toxin was in their gut uh, it eventually took hold and killed the critter. Basically, the immune system of the rats was was uh, suffering from prolonged wakefulness. You need sleep for your body to enter that ideal state, which also is an ideal healing state. And that's why when you're sick, you tend to want to sleep more. So these are the, the four quadrants that really should have been outlined by, by Skinner. Okay, continuing with the horse sense, if you look at this, you now have different similarities in both the columns and in the rows. The top, you've got two columns. One is seek. Well, the critter seeks food. It's part of uh, Maslow's physiological needs. And also you need sleep, which uh, is a critical need. So those are things critters seek. They seek, seek uh, carrots, food, and they seek sleep. And then there are things that they avoid. They, they avoid being struck by a, a whip, which is painful. And they avoid, have, horses avoid having a bridle bit pulled back into their mouth, which hurts also. So those are the two, and you call that orientation. So we seek and we avoid, and fundamentally, that's the basis of everything we do. There are things that we seek and things that we avoid. And with Maslow, the things we seek, there's a pecking order, physiological, then resources, then love, then esteem or confidence, and finally, self-actualization. And then the avoid is the opposite. We avoid death, we avoid poverty, we avoid loneliness, we avoid uh, lack of confidence, and we avoid losing any sense of uniqueness, star power. So these things correlate with, with uh, Maslow. Now, if you look at the rows with uh, a carrot, you're acting, you're, you want the horse to do something. You want that horse to come toward you to get that carrot. So you're in, incentivizing the, the horse, something that it's attracted to. And then with the whip, again, you want to make that horse active. You want it to start moving and maybe move real fast. So, so both of the, the top row relate to active use of energy. 
And meanwhile, on the bottom with the whoa, you want that horse to stop. And if that horse is going to sleep, it's not going to be running around. It's going to be pretty much stopped. So the bottom blocks there are passive situation. So going after the carrot, it's seek active. And with the whip, it's active avoid. Punishment, it's passive avoid. And with sleep, it's passive seek. So that's turning this into some concepts that, that everyone can readily understand. It makes horse sense. Now, for the next step here with Skinner, returning to the horse, even with behaviorism, there is a neutral area, and they're called neutral op operants. Just like with, with Maslow, there are things that we seek and things that we avoid, but there's stuff in the middle we just don't care about. <laughs> so that, those are called neutral operants. I like to think of uh, Rhett Butler. Those are Rhett Butler area. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. <laughs> so, we don't Why would they be classified as no energy? Is it just because it really takes no capacity to make a decision? It, yeah, like the yeah. difference? Yeah, there's no energy associated with with what's there. I mean, how many how many slats are there in Venetian blinds in your house? Are you really going to go around your house and count them? And of less interest, how many slats are there in the city that you live? Are you going to go house to house and <laughs> count the Venetian so slats? neutral operants then would be at the sheerest extreme point of pure boredom then. Yeah. Yeah. You have no interest whatsoever. No interest <laughs> at all. You don't care about them. They don't bring you any benefit and they don't bring any threats. So okay. no benefits, you don't seek them. No threats, you don't avoid them. If, okay. you're, if you're walking through the grass and you step on a bug and you kill it, do you really care? <laughs> if it's a bee and it stings you while you're stepping on it, you might care, but typically not, especially if you're wearing boots. So these are things that they have no value to you so you don't seek them, and they have no threat for you, so you don't avoid them. All right. Now, what's interesting here is your active or passive amount of energy spent. So active is relatively high energy and passive relatively low energy. And the reason that's important is because a horse has different gears. It can trot, it can canter, it can gallop, and of course it can stand and stay put. <laughs> so it's it's not like on or off. And that's the bad thing with Skinner here with his operant conditioning. It implies sort of an on and off state. But in reality, we have many states. So let's help Skinner out here. So the high energy and the, that would equate to with, with Maslow's that would seeking life and also avoiding death. So we would use a lot of energy to seek life and likewise a lot of energy to avoid death. And we would do that at a gallop. But uh, in between things that are not as important, but still important. We use some energy and both for seeking it or avoiding losing it. And that goes down. So this this falls into the pecking order of Maslow. This is a line, this is a linear drop. And just as was noted within Maslow, his highest priority, physiological needs, there is actually a pecking order buried in that. 
air is of most importance. It's the highest importance because you don't have much time to go without air. Uh, at most, a few minutes. Water, you can probably put that off for a, a couple of days or unless you're in the desert. But even there, it's not a case of seconds or minutes as it would be with air. And food, chances are you can put that off for a few days, maybe even a week, maybe even two. So there's even within what we, we're seeing here with behaviorism, there's a pecking order. Okay, and again, when you get down to a neutral op operant, there's no energy being used by the critter either to seek or to avoid whatever's there. Completely ignored. All right, now we're overlaying the hierarchy of Maslow over on top of Skinner's operant conditioning. And you've got that same situation of two wedges. There's a wedge on the left, wedge on the right, the wedge on the left is the step that we seek to vary in levels of energy and things that we avoid to varying levels of energy. And uh, down on the bottom, that's the value scale that was expressed with, with um, Maslow just a little bit ago. All right, so behavior reinforcement Seek and avoid, if it's an active seek, it's positive reinforcement. Active avoid, it's, it's negative reinforcement. If it's active, uh, I'm sorry, if it's passive punishment, uh, if it's passive avoidance, it's punishment. If it's passive seeking, it's probably resting and digesting. All right, well, let's change the critter instead of a horse, let's put in uh, Goldilocks with her little white hot rod. And why are we using Goldilocks? And it's because seeking, it can be equated to the idea of drive gear. So you go after it. You want something from the refrigerator, you put your little body in drive gear and you get up out of the chair and you walk into the kitchen and open the refrigerator and grab what you want. And uh, avoidance is more like swerve gear. As you're going into the kitchen, you swerve around the furniture. You avoid crashing into the walls and, and, and the various pieces of furniture. So it, it's avoidance gear but it's more of swerving because it's like driving and missing potholes. You don't stop and back up from a pothole. You'll get rear-ended, so you swerve around them. And for the high energy and low energy, a better term would be your gas pedal. So once you put your little body into drive gear, then you step on the gas. And it references how fast you go from your uh, study into the kitchen or uh, running to another room, the laundry room or the bathroom or whatever. I mean, you you put yourself in gear and you target someplace in your house and you drive toward it. And how fast you drive toward it is the gas pedal. And that goes for both seeking and avoiding. I mean, it's, it's the gas pedal in your car, it doesn't matter which gear you put it in, put it in drive gear or put it in reverse gear and then step on the gas pedal. And it's the more you push down the gas pedal, the faster you'll go. So the driving analogy works nicely for Skinner's um, operant conditioning, but it also works for Maslow's Okay, so that is the humanism. Uh, but before we leave, uh, 
and actually that was for behaviorism, but before we leave, let me return to humanism. And Maslow said there are different goals and needs, but he also called them desires and appetites. And they can also be called targets and objectives. And because Maslow mentioned that man is a wanting animal, you can call them wants as well. So these are all terms that are pretty much interchangeable when you talk about humanism and things that are goals and appetites and objectives and wants. You seek those. And while you're seeking those, you avoid things that interfere with achieving your goals. Now you're, we're talking about seeking goals and targets. Now it's time to talk about perceptual control theory. All right. That brings up the idea of control systems. All right, so a control system. You, Each of you have a control system in your house. And we're going to be referring to the control of perception, control theory. The book I reference is the second edition. It's by William T. Powers, his original paper book was in 1973, but the second edition came out in 2005, which is the version that I refer to primarily because he updated his theory. All right, you have a control system in your house. It's called a thermostat. Okay, so what's a control system? Well, it has a goal or target and that's what you set. So you want it to be at about 72 degrees, but you can set it for different amounts. And whatever you set it to, that's called the set point. It's also called the reference signal. So most of us have our thermostat set to about 72 degrees, the set point. All right. Now, how does the control system work? Well, the control system resists changes to the set point. And this is basically the Goldilocks rule. That's why we had Goldilocks in her little white hot rod. Okay. So here we have the set point at 72 degrees. And what if it goes up? It's now 80 degrees. Ooh, that's much too hot of the house. So if it's too hot, the thermostat turns on the air conditioning. And after a while, with the air conditioning on, it brings the temperature back down to 72 degrees. And at that point, is it still too hot? No, it's just right. And that's what Goldilocks says. It's just right. It's not too high. It's not too low. And so she turns off the air conditioning. Now, what happens if it's at night and the temperature goes down at 60 degrees? Oh, now it's too cold. So the thermostat turns on the furnace and it runs for a while and it brings the temperature back up to 72 degrees. And at that point, is it too cold? No, the temperature is just right. And the thermostat turns off the, the furnace. So that's why this is the Goldilocks rule is because with a control system, it resists changes to whatever you set it at. It resists changes to the set point or the reference signal. And uh, it will automatically compensate if things go out of range. So that's, an, a, very, that's a very important system because it actually is the foundation of the endocrine system of your body. And the endocrine system manages your internal temperature. If you want to be 98.6 or other factors with your, your bloodstream and, and other signals going throughout your body. So your body basically is a control system. Actually, it's a multitude of control systems all integrated and working together. All right. So what we've done is we've looked at a 
goal or target with a set point reference signal, and that's for temperature control. But again, your body uses it for other things, and even your mind, your mental thinking, like for visual control. So how does this work for visual control? Well, it's eye-hand coordination. There's so much you do where you work with a goal. You reach for things. You go into the kitchen and you re reach for the handle on the refrigerator. You reach for the knobs on the stove and you turn them and you watch what you're turning them to. You need to turn the 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 range, the stove up to high temperature, low temperature, or somewhere in between. So these are all control systems that you are affecting. But also the, the area that is probably most important is while you're driving a car, you have to stay in your lane. And this is another example of a control system. So here's a Goldilocks, she's driving down the road and in the distance she's looking at where the road is going and that is her reference signal she wants to keep pointing at the roadway that is her goal that's her target is to keep pointing down the road and while she's driving oh she starts veering off to the right oh look out for Goldilocks and what she does and with a with a control system, it compensates and corrects for deviations from the re uh, reference signal. So she sees that she's running off the road, so she turns the steering wheel to bring her car back so that her reference signal, again, is looking down the road. And if she veering off to the left, crossing the double line, then she's in danger of hitting oncoming traffic. So once again, a control system resists changes to the reference signal to the set point and it enacts behavior which will bring the person, the animal, whatever, back into alignment with the set point or the reference signal. And the reference signal for Goldilocks is seeing the road down in front of her. So these are all examples of control systems in operation. On the road, going off to the right, she's in danger, so she doesn't want to go too far right. And she doesn't want to go too far left because then she's going to go into oncoming traffic or worse, run off into <coughs> the trees. So she wants something in between, which is just right. And that's why it's the Goldilocks rule. She doesn't want porridge that's too hot or too cold. She wants it just right. She doesn't want a bed that's too soft or too hard. She wants it just right. So... <sighs> You can call this Goldilocks rule or Aristotle's rule. Aristotle said this over 2,000 years ago that we need, need to avoid the extremes. Uh, too much or too little. And we need to find something in between. And that's why Aristotle often, his statement is referred to as moderation in all things. And it basically gets back to perceptual control theory, having set points and goals and so forth. And uh, so that is how it's dealt with today, perceptual control theory. But it has old, old roots. It goes back to Aristotle's rule, and I'm sure it goes back further in antiquity to archers and how to shoot an arrow and hit the mark. They've got to consider the wind and the range and all those things, and they have to make adjustments. And that's what Goldilocks was doing here. She was constantly making adjustments. And you do that as you're driving, especially here in Colorado, driving the, in the mountains with all the curves and so forth. You're constantly making adjustments. And you do it on the highway with traffic, automobiles to your right, 
to your left, if, uh, if you're in a six or eight line lane highway, you're constantly watching everything that's going around you and you're continuing to guide yourself. You're slowing down with traffic. You're speeding up when traffic speeds up. All sorts of adjustments. And you're avoiding extremes. Too much of one thing, too, not enough of something else. You're looking for something in between, which is just right. The Goldilocks rule. All right. So we've looked at perceptual control theory, which is fundamentally all about control systems. And perceptual control systems are the foundation of consciousness. Let's say you're a farmer on a tractor, just like driving down the highway. The farmer is trying to have his line straight. So he's guiding his tractor so that the lines don't go all over the place. He wants straight lines because he can plant seeds more easily that way. Everything works better if it's systematic. So he avoids not being systematic. Doing shopping, all kinds of, of use of control systems. You've got to keep control of the shopping cart maneuver it around, going up and down the aisles, and they have all sorts of things they're trying to sell you that are stacked in, in little displays right in the middle of the aisle. And there are other shoppers in their carts. So you're constantly maneuvering your cart in between other carts and around these displays and so forth. <clears throat> and when you find something on a shelf you want, you have to maneuver and use eye-hand coordination to pick the product, the, the can of soup or the, the box of, of rice or cereal off the shelf. And then you have to use eye-hand coordination to find a place to put it in your, in your cart. So every moment you're shopping in a grocery store and probably any store, you're constantly using eye-hand coordination and perceptual control theory. In fact, there is almost nothing that you do that doesn't use it. Even if you have a goal uh, at a job, you want to get a project done. So your goal is that project and you want to avoid the project failing and so now you're caught up with Maslow's hierarchy of needs and also control systems. How much money do you need to fund it? Funding a project, you need resources. How many people do you need to get the project done? These are the logistics. So you, you are trying to come up with a good estimate of the resources, people, and, and money, resources, basically, to get the job done. And you don't want to have too much because resources are expensive. So you don't want to go over budget. And at the same time, uh, if the resources are there, you want to make sure you utilize the resources effectively. So control systems are constantly, it's probably, if not, the most important behavior while you were in your waking state, it's pretty darn close to the top. You're constantly using it. Coming up to a traffic light, you're very attentive to whether it's red, yellow, or green, and you adjust your behavior based on what you you see. And you, you adjust it constantly as you're slowing down for red light or slowing down for a school zone, 20 miles per hour, or speeding up after the light turns green and avoiding pedestrians who might still be in the crosswalks. I mean, there's so many things that you're conscious of using eye-hand coordination, writing your name with a pen or a pencil or typing it. You target the keys on your keyboard. 
and you want to spell things correctly, if you want to spell perceptual control system, well, you look for a P in the shift key to get a capital P, then the small E, and then the R is right there. That's easy. So, I mean, just hunting and pecking at your computer laptop, you're using control, uh, perceptual control theory, which is effectively your, your control system. If you're fixing your car, oh, well, yeah, sometimes you're not interested in being very exact and you want to destroy that sucker because it's been a pain. But usually, like using a wrench for a bolt, it's a certain width. <clears throat> it's like a three-quarters inch wrench or one-eighth of an inch wrench, depending on what the bolt is, or you're going to use a Phillips screwdriver or a regular straight edge school, uh, screwdriver. So <clears throat> you're using control systems when you're fixing th something, making repairs at home, or just cleaning your house, vacuuming, doing laundry. It is constant. Let's say you're making marshmallows on a fire. Well, there's another classic case of perceptual control theory. You don't want to have the marshmallows too close to the fire because they'll burn up. And you don't want them too far away because they won't get toasted. So it's a constant situation of you adjusting and doing a status. Well, if it's turning brown, maybe it's time for me to turn the marshmallow over to get brown on the other side. Uh, it's when you really look at yourself and what you're doing all the time even right now is the volume high enough for you low enough you can adjust the volume you do that in the automobile while you're driving down the road and you've got music blaring in your car you can turn up the volume or turn it down these are all control system factors okay so now we're back to the main screen. So we've talked about humanism, behaviorism, and perceptual control theory, which is basically control systems. Any questions about any of those through three before we go on? No. All right, was, was no. that? No. Was that easily understood? Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, well, let's press forward. So we've talked about humanism, behaviorism. We've talked about perceptual control theory. We've talked about physics originally, E equals MC squared. And inadvertently, we talked about neuroscience and a little bit about consciousness and the subconscious. I do have one question. Sure. It wasn't up there, but where exactly does cognition fit into it or is that more of like under the neuroscience and consciousness yeah we've got to crawl before we walk walk before okay. we run and run oh well, that's fine we, no it was just fly. a question no worries yeah we'll get to cognitive science it's on the list cool. go, there it is down on the bottom in the middle cognitive science and then cool. cognitive science also includes philosophy and we've touched on that already. We talked, touched, or we talked about Aristotle. And uh, some of the things we've talked about in within neuroscience, we'll be getting to that right now. But we can't okay. cover the entire area in just one uh, little bit. We've been doing this for about an hour. <laughs> you are getting a boatload of powerful theoretical knowledge in just a very, very short time. And right now we're going to continue with neuroscience. And we did earlier talking about drive gear, swerve gear, and the gas pedal. Those actually relate to neuroscience. And the value scale, which is presented both with Maslow and with uh, Skinner, that 
relates to neuroscience as well. And again, with the value scale, I'm color coding this. So positive stuff are in green, negative stuff in red, and stuff that is neutral, it doesn't matter, it's in black. And you see the colors blur and into the middle area. So it, it, there's a point where it's very hard to tell if it's positive or negative. Now, all of these things fall into the diagram. Uh, before we go, this is uh, from Maslow. There are things we want, things that we don't want. And the diagram that it this all gets integrated into the Rosetta Stone is emotive energy. All right, now with emotive energy, let's start looking at what these different gears are within neuroscience. So what's the gas pedal? Well, that's called the somatic nervous system. And it's your gas pedal. It goes from low energy to high energy. You're probably going to want to call it the gas pedal rather than the somatic nervous system. But if you're going to look this up <laughs> in an encyclopedia or on, on uh, Google, you're going to Google it. You Google the somatic nervous system. Okay, what about swerve gear, avoidance gear? Well, that's actually the sympathetic nervous system. A really ugly term. But the last one is an even uglier term. Drive gear, that's the parasympathetic nervous system. So those are the true terms within neuroscience that if you want to find out more, you're going to have to research it based on those terms. So what about those wedges of what you want, don't want. What, how do those end up on the emotive energy diagram? Well, they end up as two curved lines. The red line is with the sympathetic nervous system. These are things you don't want. And the green line are things you do want. And those are all related to the parasympathetic nervous system. So that integrates just about everything. <clears throat> now, there is another area. It's called the efficiency curve there. But it creates a bowl-like structure. And what is not clear from the diagram initially is, since the diagram is two-dimensional, there is a three-dimensional factor, and that's emotions, and it falls within that bowl shape, and it's called the emotional bowl, and that's how it fits in. And there are some emotions that you don't want to ever have again. You don't want rage or terror or fear or sadness. They are, they are not fun. They're not enjoyable. And they're actually stressful, and that's why. How do you how do you stop them? Well, they have an evolutionary purpose. They have evolved for a reason, and there is a case related to that. I don't want to start there, but earlier we talked about over on the left the somatic nervous system, everything that gets stored in your brain has an indicator of positive or ne negative. And there is one neuroscientist who calls it a marker. He calls it a somatic marker, which re relates to the somatic nervous system. And it is basically related to parts of the brain, which I, I don't want to get into yet, but eventually it relates to the amygdala and the hippocampus and also uh, the hypothalamus. I mean, it's all it can be explained and we'll eventually get to that stuff. But what appears to happen, this guy who came up with the idea of the somatic marker, his name was Antonio Damasio. 
And I think he was at the University of Iowa for a while. So there's a marker that goes on every experience you have. And the marker says, is it a good experience or is it a bad experience? And a good experience will be marked positively and a bad experience will be marked negatively. And it, it, it appears, my theory is that it's more of a case of how much negativity is included. Any experience that doesn't have a positive or negative uh, trace to it has a neutral trace. So when a, a, a memory or an experience gets marked for storage in memory, the part of the, the brain applies an amount of negative energy. So if you've got an experience that goes through with no negative energy being attached, then it's ecstatic. You love it. <laughs> and But normal behavior is at a low energy level. So if you look at the diagram, uh, your normal state is low energy. And that's because the purpose is to keep your energy usage minimum, minimal. And it pisses us off because we want to dance and have fun, but that takes energy. But the evolution has forced us to try and conserve energy. So as a result, our emotions typically at our low level, and that's why people think of rational thought as not being emotional not because it's not emotional, it's because it's our, our thinking is at a low emotional memory. And that gets back down, down to Elizabeth Duffy that emotions run on a continuum from low to high. And it's the low emotion that we say, well, it was rational, there's no emotion. <laughs> I don't think so. But for that trace, I call it a, an emotive trace. Uh, Antonio Damasio calls it a somatic marker. Another biologist, Victor S. Johnston, calls it a hedonic tone. So three different researchers have theorized the existence of this. And it was probably most noteworthy because of research by Antonio Damasio. He is a researcher in neuroscience and he gets to see all sorts of neurological damage. And he had one, he had one uh, patient and she was Pollyanna. And Pollyanna knows no fear. <laughs> She was always happy. <laughs> but uh, all experiences go through the amygdala, which generates fear so, to some degree. And if it, uh, something gets through the amygdala without being attached any negativity, then we end up being ecstatic. And that was accidentally shown by James Olds and Peter Milner in the 1950s when they tried to put a, a pin or a, a, a probe, an electrode, into part of the reward center. No, no, part of the stress system of the rats. And they missed <laughs> and they put it in the reward system and so rather than it causing the rats to to show fear uh, the rats were ecstatic and they had it this attached to a button so the rats would start pushing that button constantly until they were exhausted and fell over from exhaustion so with Within the hypothalamus, that's where 
Olds and Milner were working, there is a point which relates to fear and another point which relates to happiness. So with that, the reason it's important about Pollyanna is she had her amygdala, part of the brain that marks negativity. It was, she had a disease where it was turned to bone. It was calcified. And so the amygdala was not working. So there was no fear being attached to the memories going through the system. <laughs> so if a memory comes up through the processing, through the amygdala, and, there was, and there's no negativity attached, then you, it gets marked with ecstasy. <laughs> So that's why she was Pollyanna, because her amygdala was turned to bone, turned to rock, calcium, calcium. So basically, uh, our emotions go from a low level of emotion to a high level, just like Elizabeth Duffy st stated. And our various emotions have those different levels indicated. I mean, we on the uh, fear side or the negative side, we could be wary. Wary is way down at the bottom. Wary is, or vigilant. It's not like we're scared yet, but we're concerned. But if it starts getting more intense, then it turns into fear. And if it gets even more intense, it turns into terror. And if we're angry, uh, low level, we're irked, but then it starts growing into annoyance, and then it turns into anger and eventually turns into rage, and so rage is took close to the top rim of the emotional bowl. And uh, all of our emotions have different levels, and this comes, I don't have it in this screen, but it relates to Robert Pluchek's emotional bowl. That's where this comes from. And he used to use the term his orange model. And, and it wasn't a color it related to the citrus fruit. And I prefer using grapefruit because anytime I use an orange model, people will say, oh, what color? <laughs> no, it's not a color. It's citrus fruit. So I'm, I prefer calling it blue chicks grapefruit model. He's gone beyond that. He uses a lotus blossom now, but I think the grapefruit is much better because it fits into this diagram. There's that bowl shape. And that will be in a, a future presentation about his bowl. So that's the emotive energy diagram. And it can be used to explain everything, including what you buy at the store and you're looking for a bargain. Well, the reason you're looking for a bargain is the need for you to conserve resources. And that's what the efficiency curve. So if you're buying a car, a new car, and it's, and, uh, it's priced at $25,000, that's the price the manufacturer has set. But on the other hand, you would like to get a discount. So you trade in your current car and you hope you'll get maybe $4,000 for it. So that brings it down from 25 to 21,000. But you shop around, you call, look at different dealers or you go with uh, different national groups and you try and find that same car at a lesser amount. Maybe you can get it down for around 18,000. So given that choice of 25,000 or 21,000 or 18,000, chances are you'll go after the 18,000. So that's all part of sales and marketing. That gold area, the somatic nervous system, that is what you can adjust and how you can get things for less than the maximum resources.
That's where bargaining comes in. Bargain, bargain, bargain. And a good example is on the left side there, the most important thing in your life is air to breathe. <laughs> and you'll do anything to get air to breathe. But it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And it's free. So do you worry about that? Are you going to go to France? Are you going to go to Tahiti? Are you going to go to South America? Are you going to go to Hawaii? Do you worry about air to breathe? No. And it's, it's always available in as much quantity as you want. But if you're a scuba diver like I've been, now you're concerned about the amount of air to breathe. So if you're 100 feet underwater and you're worried about the amount of air that's left in your tank, that's why there's a gauge that lets you know how much air is left and you've got to allow for enough air to get you back to the surface. And you can't just swim quickly to the uh, surface because you'll get uh, the bends and die. So you have to go up slowly. So you've got to allow enough air remaining in your tanks to to climb slowly to the surface and have what they call safety stops where you get to like 20 feet below the surface and you just sit there 15, 20 feet and you wait there for a few minutes while your blood gets some nitrogen out of it, you're breathing. And then once you've had your safety stop, then you come back up. So air is usually not an issue for us. But if you're a scuba diver, suddenly it is. So even it's though it's the most important thing on the list, it's not something you spend a lot of time or resources worrying about because it's ubiquitous and it's free. So the efficiency curve is very important for how much we spend for various commodities, for how much time and how much energy and that's why it says pressure to conserve resources, time, sweat, and money. Those are the things that we are being pressured to conserve by evolution. Okay. So rather than those ugly terms that neuroscientists use, you'll probably prefer using drive gear, swerve gear, and the gas pedal. And you use that all the time, going around your house, going up and down stairs, moving around furniture. You swerve around the furniture, you swerve around the dogs and the cats, and your drive gear is, is set up. You've got a goal, you wanna to get to the refrigerator, you wanna to get to the bathroom, you wanna to get to bed at night, you wanna get out to your car. So you have all these different goals. And once you have a goal, now you've got control system issues. You've got to make sure that you follow Goldilocks rule. Uh, everything has got to work out just right. And it's a range and most control systems have ranges. Too hot, too cold. Well, what's too hot, what's too cold? What's too spicy? My wife, Jane, will can eat food that's a lot spicier than I can tolerate. So, and, uh, you know, it shows up with, with drinks as well. Do you like wine that's dry or sweet? And, uh, when we were in California visiting some of the wineries, the question they would ask us, how do you take your your coffee and Jane takes her coffee black and I like cream in it or, or milk. And so just based on that, the specialists at the winery knew that Jane could tolerate drier wine and I needed something that was a little sweeter. So we have different tastes and it's, and those tastes are typical of control systems. We have what we like, what we don't like, and it shows up in our choice in music, and choice in food, choice of books to read, things to do. And that's why earlier I noted that perceptual control theory is 
fundamental to consciousness. And that brings us back here. So we've talked about physics. We talked about humanism, behaviorism, perceptual control theory. And we've talked a bit about neuroscience and consciousness. And that is a good lead in for the next section, which is going to be more convoluted because it's about consciousness and the subconscious, which is something that even scientists are grappling with right now. And uh, I don't think it should be grappled with. There's something pretty obvious. And that's what we'll be talking about next time. And so that symbol on the, the right in the background there, that is an image of the Rosetta Stone that was found in Egypt in the early 1800s. It's the symbolic image of the mode of energy diagram. You've got the red line of the swerve gear or the sympathetic nervous gear. You've got the uh, green line of the drive gear or the parasympathetic nervous system. And the gold shading and the gold arrow on the left represents the variability of the somatic nervous system. So that's all indicated in the emotive energy diagram. And it explains all of psychology and explains all of neuroscience. So that's why the cartoon image of of the brain is there and the brain stem and that little thing underneath is intended to represent the cerebellum. But uh, the mode of energy is, again, the Rosetta Stone of psychology. So the next presentation, we'll get into consciousness, figure that out. All right, I'm going to uh, okay, these are my last screens. Yeah, most of the stuff is in the Reignite Your Creativity book, which all of you have copies of, at least in soft copy with the PDF, if not the paperback. Yep. Okay. Before I turn off the the recording, any last questions that you want me to answer? I had one. I did. Um, 